Okay, so today I'm going to be telling you about um, work that uh, we've been doing in my lab on neural, mecha neural mechanisms of wind pair perception in Drosophila. Um, that'll be the majority of the talk. And then along the way, if you have questions, feel free to jump in and ask questions. If I get to it, I'm also going to talk a bit um, at the end about a kind of side project in the lab, a passion project of mine about cold tolerance snowflies, which are um, a species of fly that live in extreme alpine, very cold environments. Uh, so if I get there, I will. I will talk about that as well. Okay, um, and to start off, I will just because I feel like I was running time at the end to acknowledge the people that actually did the work. This is my lab. The people whose work I'll be discussing today are Sweta, Chris, Pierre, Dominic, and Anne at different points in the talk. Um, but it's also a very collaborative lab. And so, for example, in part of the talk where I discuss our analysis of the um, Drosophila connectome, everybody contributed to that. So. Um, in some small way, everybody in this group contributed to the work I'll be showing you today. Um, and the papers that are referred to, if you um, if you want to look any of them up, you can look at uh, you can find them all on our website. Um, and other papers that are referred to, all uh, I will provide like a DOI or something. Okay, so my last study is per perception. Per perception, um, as many of you probably know, is the sense of where our bodies are in space and how they move through space. And so all animals possess this relatively poorly understood sense. Within our own bodies, we have populations of perperceptive sensory neurons that are distributed throughout our muscles and throughout our joints, and they um, detect mechanical forces within the body and fire patterns and action potentials as we move and as we reposition our body. Um, and these signals are then transmitted um, in, the, in the case of in our bodies from the limbs into the spinal cord. And the, um, the, the brain and the body form a series of feedback loops that are linked by, and for that reason are entirely dependent on this sense of proprioception. And it's a, it's a sense that is largely subconscious. We're not often thinking about how our bodies are moving or where they are in space, but it's really essential for um, both our, uh, our kind of experience of the world and also how we move through the world. And so human patients that lack proprioception are initially entirely unable to generate coordinated movements. Eventually, people can learn to move their bodies under visual control. So perception is really essential for um, almost every behavior that, that you will execute. A lot of the early stages of perception processing in our bodies and humans and in other vertebrates happen deep within the spinal cord. Um, and so for that reason, it's historically been really difficult to record signals from the perceptive system in an animal that is actively moving and, and behaving. Um, and so this is one reason, among other reasons, why we study the sense of perception in a genetic model organism, the fruit fly, Drosophila. So fruit flies um, are uh, remarkably agile and exhibit kind of virtuosic motor control. So here, what I'm showing is a movie of a fruit fly that is tethered to a pin and walking on a spherical treadmill. This movie is slowed down by a factor of 20. And then down below here, I'm plotting the angle between the fly's femur and tibia joint. That's this joint right here. Um, and I, I show this to illustrate a couple of things. One is that fly walking is extremely fast. They're taking something between 10 and 20 steps per second with each of their six legs. And it's also quite flexible. Uh, these trajectories differ from cycle to cycle. The fly might be turning to avoid an object or like navigating toward some object uh, in the distance. And so there's this combination of speed and flexibility that characterizes fly locomotion that make it uh, just an incredibly fascinating system to study how it is that they sense their bodies and then how um, the nervous system then controls movements. The other big reason that we study Drosophila is that we have a very compact nervous system within the fly. So the brain, the central brain shown here is about 120,000 neurons and the ventral nerve cord is about 17,000 neurons. The ventral nerve cord, which is the part of the nervous system that we study, is analogous to the spinal cord. And the brain and the ventral nerve cord are connected by a few thousand ascending and descending axons. And the brain, just to give you a sense of scale, is about the size of a sesame seed. So about 120,000 neurons in a sesame seed um, is numerically compact enough that it feels like maybe within my lifetime or somebody else's lifetime, we might be able to understand how this thing works, as opposed to our own brains, which seems a little bit less tractable right now. And in Drosophila, we have access to genetic tools that allow us to label and manipulate particular cell types. So here, we're using a genetic driver line to label with a fluorescent protein, a, a small number of neurons within the ventral nerve cord that we can then go in and target for recording. 
where we can use different tools to activate or silence those neurons and then measure their effects on behavior. Okay, so this is kind of the, the reason that we study the fly. Tech nervous system, abundance of genetic tools, a lot of experimental tractability. Okay, flies also possess different subtypes of proprioceptors like we do. So in our own bodies, we have muscle spindles, Golgi tendon organs, and then different receptors in the joints that are encoding different things about what the body is doing. And flies possess different subtypes of proprioceptors as well. And there are three basic types called hair plates, campaniforms and cilla, and cortisol neurons. Um, and um, some groups here, like Simon's lab, have successfully studied uh, campaniforms and cilla um, in, in uh, other insects. Uh, we focus mainly on this structure called the temporal tunnel organ, which I'll be discussing in a couple slides. But the important thing I want to illustrate here is that these proprioceptors are distributed across the fly's body. So that essentially every movement is detected by a kind of ensemble of proprioceptors. And one of the first things that we did in my lab was to just ask, what is the parts list of all the proprioceptors that are distributed across the leg? So we use this technique called X-ray nanotomography, where we imaged an entire fly leg. Um, in an X-ray synchrotron, and then reconstructed all of the muscles, all the proprioceptors in the leg. And what we found is that each leg contains about 225 proprioceptor neurons, and they're distributed um, throughout the leg. Um, and these uh, ones shown here, the 152 corticonal sensory neurons are the ones I'll be focusing on primarily today for reasons that I'll explain in a little bit. Uh, and just to return to the is this idea of subtypes. One really interesting thing, when we look at the properties of fly proprioceptors, compare them to the functional properties of proprioceptors that have been characterized in other animals, like in, in this case, these are examples of proprioceptors from mice. We see that many of the same um, mechanical parameters or uh, kinematic parameters, in a sense, are detected by these different proprioceptors. So hair plates in, um, in flies detect position of joints, whereas joint receptors in, in mammals um, serve a similar function. Campaniforms and cilla in insects detect the load on the body. So when the limb is actually contacting the ground, that's signaled by campaniforms and cilla. And in mammals, um, similarly by gold dependent organs. And then the cortisol neurons I'll be talking about today, they operate in a manner that is uh, in, a, in a kind of coding sense analogous to muscle spindles, in that they're um, sensing the, the position and the movement of, of uh, joints. In, in mammals, they're actually sensing movement to the position of muscles, but in this case, as I'll show you, the cortisol neurons are, care more about what the actual joint angles are. Okay, so the system that I'll be discussing today is called the femoral cortisol organ. This is a group of about 150 proprioceptors that are located in the fly's femur. So these are the sensor neurons in the femur, and then they're connected by a series of three tendons to the tibia. So when the femur moves relative to the tibia, it stretches, pulls on these tendons, stretches the dendrites of the proprioceptor neurons. And this is a reconstruction that we made from that x-ray data set where we've um, essentially gone in and identified where all the cell bodies are, reconstructed how their dendrites attach to the tendons and trace their connections down to their base of the tibia. And so essentially what's happening is that when the, when the tibia um, flexes, it's pulling on these tendons and it's exciting these uh, mechanosensory neurons within the cortisol organ. The nice thing about proprioceptors in the fly is compared to, for example, muscle spindles, which like Tim and, and uh, Lena said here, is that it's not innervated by any um, uh, efferent signals from the central nervous system. And so these neurons are essentially detecting the forces that are created by moving the joint without any kind of top-down input that is changing their sensitivity. And so as I'll show you, what this means is that we can essentially we know what the neural activity of these neurons is just by the position and the movement of the joint. And this has, I think, virtues for, for understanding their function. Okay, so the proprioceptive cell bodies of the cortisol neurons are located out in the leg, and so they're dendrites, which is where they sense mechanical forces. But then their axons project through the leg nerve into the ventral nerve cord, the part of the nervous system the fly that is analogous to the spinal cord. So here I'm labeling with a fluorescent protein all the proprioceptors coming into the fly's six legs. So just orienting the ventral nerve cord, each of these balls of neurofil shown in blue here is a countersane against all the synapses in the nervous system. Each one of these balls corresponds to one of the six legs. So the, these here are the axons that are projecting in from the fly's right front leg. Okay, 
This is a driver line that labels all of the prick receptors in the leg. But one of the first things we wanted to do was ask about the different subtypes that exist within this organ. And so we used Drosophila genetic tools to build specific driver lines that label smaller subsets of, of PERP receptors within the organ. Um, and those four different subtypes are shown here. Um, we refer to them as hook neurons. So these ones that have a shape kind of like a hook and then claw neurons, this kind of uh, tripartite structure here that looks a bit like a claw. So these, these are the axons of the PERP receptors projecting into the central nerve cord. And the hook and claw neurons obviously have different morphology, but suggest that they're probably connected to different downstream partners and may have different function. And so we developed a system, specifically at Kira Mamiya, who was a research scientist, and have developed a system that allowed us to take control of the femur tibia joint. So we glue a little magnet onto the tibia, sorry, we glue a little pin onto the tibia, and then we use a magnet out of a motor to move the joint around. So we can passively move the fly's limb. And then at the same time, the fly is mounted under a two-photon microscope, so we can express a calcium indicator in these neurons, and then optically record their activity from the axons as we move the joint around. Okay, and the activity we record looks something like this. So we start with the leg extended, and then we flex it, uh, hold it there for a bit, and then bring it back to extension again. When we do that, what we see in claw neurons is that one population of neurons turns on when the leg is flexed, and another population turns on when the leg is extended. So these neurons are, are kind of continually active when the leg is held at a certain position. So they're basically encoding the angle of the joint, whether it's flex or extended. Um, you can see that here in this movie. So these are calcium signals that are being recorded um, uh, from the leg. And this little cartoon shows us moving the femur tibia joint back and forth. And you can see at one position, one group turns on, at the other position, the other turns on. Okay, so we have two populations, two subtypes of PERP receptors that are encoding flexion and extension. Here we're recording from a, a small population. Each one of these driver lines labels something like 10 neurons. We know from other experiments that if we label a single one of these neurons, each cell is encoding a specific angular range. So while as a group, they may be encoding extension, a particular cell might be encoding the angle between 160 and 140 degrees. And as a population, they kind of tile the whole range of joint angles. So there's a fractionation of the range across the, across the joint. Um, and as a group, the claw neurons are encoding that, that angle. Okay, so claw neurons encode the position of the joint. The hook neurons, on the other hand, are encoding the movement of the joint. And they do so in a directionally tuned manner. So the hook extension neurons fire when the leg moves toward extension. So if the leg starts flexing it and extends, their activity increases transiently. Um, the hook flexion neurons have the opposite property. They don't fire when the leg extends, but they, um, they do become active when the leg moves toward flexion. So to kind of summarize, these are the, the bare bones of what you need to understand to follow the rest of my talk. The claw neurons encode the position of the leg. There are flexion and extension tube subtypes. The hook neurons encode the movement of the leg and there are flexion and extension to the subtypes. And so these are the kind of basic signals that are transmitted to, to the nervous system about the flies leg joints. Okay, any questions about this before I move on? This is kind of the end of my intro. Okay. Okay, so um, that, that I think is a pretty good summary of our published work so far. So I'm starting to move into some questions um, that we've been asking more recently and this work is as yet unpublished. But the question that we um, are really, <clears throat> sorry, really fascinated by that has been interesting to a lot of people for a long time is the modulation of perp receptive reflexes during locomotion. So um, we, uh, you're probably familiar with perp receptive reflexes like the single, the, the simple knee tap reflex where if your knees tap, you get this uh, uh, extension of the joint. Uh, but the thing about these reflexes is that they can't operate under all circumstances. There are, are reflexive um, uh, movements that we have that are important when we're just standing. But if you were to act, if those reflexes were intact when you would try to walk, then they would actively prevent you from walking. So there needs to be some way to kind of tune up and down these reflex loops, um, depending on what what the animal wants to do or what we want to do. Okay, so a good example of this um, 
from a little while back that may be familiar to some of you is, is uh, an example from the cat. So if you stimulate a particular prep receptor when a cat is just standing, you see that it drives flexion of the limb. But if you do, if you stimulate the same prep receptor, so the same pattern of stimulation when the, when the cat is walking, you then get extension of the same limb. And so this is something that you see across uh, many different prep receptor reflexes. You can also observe it in the uh, recording from the, from the muscles. So you see here at, under passive conditions when you see the prep receptors, you actually get a reduction in the EMG signal. Um, but when the cat is walking, then you get a reversal of the signal and you get an increase in the EMG signal. Okay, so this kind of phenomenon has been observed many times and is thought to underlie kind of flexible tuning of reflexes um, uh, probably in many different animals. But the underlying mechanisms of how this works are, are still kind of mysterious. So um, one way that it, it is thought that this could happen is that you have a prep receptor that is projecting, for example, into the central nervous system. It connects to some postsynaptic neuron that is going to drive a reflex. But then you have inhibition onto the axon terminal, the prep receptor. So this is called presynaptic inhibition. And so this inhibitory interneuron, for example, would suppress the output of the prep receptor, depending on, like, for example, if the cat wanted to walk, it would suppress the output of this prep receptor and kind of gate the reflex downstream. Um, and it has been observed in many different systems that this presynaptic, this uh, motif of presynaptic inhibition uh, exists, but it's been very hard to understand, like, how does this work when an animal's behaving? And so what we set out to do was to ask, in these prep receptors that I described to you, is their activity modulated when the fly is actively moving versus in the conditions I've already shown you when we were passively moving the limb around. So to do this, we needed to record from these prep receptors in the condition like this when the fly is actively moving. Okay, so a postdoc in the lab, Chris Dahlman, um, set out to develop tools that will allow us to do calcium imaging and movement tracking as a fly is actively walking. So um, he has a fly that is tethered in, in a holder under a two-photon microscope on a, a spherical treadmill. Um, uh, so it's this position something like this. And we track the um, fly's leg kinematics, so the movement of the joints as it's walking using a deep lab cut and a 3D tracking tool that we, that we developed in our lab called Adipose. So we have multiple cameras around the fly. We're tracking its joints in 3D. We measure the walking velocity and the turning of the fly um, by tracking the ball that it's walking on using software called FitTrack. And then we also use calcium imaging to record activity from prep receptors, as I showed you earlier, except now the fly is actively moving. Okay, so one challenge with these experiments is that flies walk super fast, and the calcium indicator that we're using to record these signals is slow. And so doing a, di <clears throat> a direct comparison between like the, the fly walking and the fly standing is uh, technically challenging. So instead of doing that direct comparison, we've taken a modeling approach that allows us to identify differences between the encoding of active movements during be behavior and the encoding of passive movements when we are moving the joint around. So what we do is we take joint angles that we track from a walking fly, we pass them we, through what we call a passive model. So this is a model that has some activation function that mimics the position or the velocity tuning, the prep receptors. It also has a component that the models, the uh, low pass filtering of, of the calcium indicator, GCAMP. And we can then predict from this model if we, um, what the kind of natural kinematics we record from a fly would look like. And then we compare this to the activity that we actually measure. So we're essentially, taking the properties of prep receptors and the properties of the, um, of the calcium indicator, predicting activity and then comparing it to our signal. Okay, so, um, so this is kind of the workflow. We take measured joint angles from uh, naturally walking flies and then pass it through the, a subtype filter and the GCAM kernel. And so the models look something like this. So here, this is, <clears throat> this is measured neural activity like in the experiments I showed you before, where here we're moving the leg from extension to flexion. And so you can see, in this case, this particular drive line we're using labels neurons that respond to both extension and flexion. And so activity is highest when the leg is extended or when it's flexed. Um, and our, and our, our simple model just increases in a similar manner. So when activity is minimal around 
around 90 degrees, and then we'll like extend it or flex activity increases. And so we can essentially reproduce the basic features of the position tune claw neurons. And then for the hook neurons, um, to the same stimulus, we see that if, uh, for example, in this case, these are hooked flexion neurons. So as we move from extension toward flexion, they're becoming active during each one of these little steps. And here we have a, a simple step function on the velocity um, that reproduces um, that activity. So we have this very simple models that reproduce the activ activity of the, of the claw neurons and of the hook neurons. And so with this, we can then essentially predict what the activity is that we would record with calcium imaging um, during um, regular walking that we record um, as the fly is participating in the experiment, it's walking on the rig. So here we're just essentially simulating using these models how we would expect the claw flexion, extension, and hook neurons to fire as the fly is walking. Okay, so we have this model that we can use to predict activity, and now we want to compare it to the signals that we actually measure. Okay, so in this experiment now, there's a lot going on in the slide, so I'll just kind of walk you through it. The fly is tethered um, on the treadmill. Sorry, it's getting a little, a little laggy. It gets laggy if I move around, so I'm, I just might not use the pointer at all. So the fly is on the treadmill. It is occasionally walking, occasionally standing. In green, we're plotting the measured neural activity, so the calcium signal, which um, we get from comparing the ratio of the calcium indicator, GCAMP, to a, a static fluorophore, TD tomato, which is just used for motion correction. So in green is the measured neural activity, and then we're tracking in 3D the joint angle of the femur tibia joint as the fly walks, and then plotted below is the velocity that we get from tracking the movement of the ball. Okay, so what you can see if you look at this is that um, the joint angle, as the joint angle changes, the activity of the periphery receptors also changes. It's not, we're here recording from these position tuned periphery receptors. So if we had a perfect recording, we'd see that every time the fly took a step, we'd see activity go up and down, but because if this filtered signal, it kind of occasionally is high, occasionally low, but this is captured by the model. So here, if we now just compare these two traces, the predictions of the model um, are quite similar to the actual neural activity that we record here. And this is because the fly walks for a bit, and then when it stops, sometimes its leg is a bit more extended, sometimes it's a bit more flexed, and so activity might be higher or lower. And so if we do this across flies, what we see is that our um, simple passive model um, does a pretty good job of predicting the activity of the of the claw neuron. So we measure this here as the cross correlation between the prediction and the measured neural activity. And this is also true if we look across different behaviors. So here um, in black are, is the activity of the claw neurons. The fly is resting if it's walking or if it's grooming. Um, and then shown over here is a plot of the activity as a function of the joint angle. So when the fly stops to rest in particular joint angle. Like we see during the passive movements, activity is higher when legs either extended or flexed. And these properties are relatively well captured by our, our simple models. So what this shows is that the passive model, because it's not that different from what we record during active behavior, these particular perp receptors don't seem to be strongly modulated when the fly is walking versus when it's resting. So they may be more or less uh, uh, operating in a, in a similar manner during the active state or during the passive state. But I'm showing you this kind of lack of a difference for a reason, which is that when we look at the other group of axons, hook axons, here we see something really different. Okay, so again, I'm plotting the data in the same way. We have measured neural activity, the joint angle of the fly, the walking velocity. Um, and you may already kind of be able to tell that the measured neural activity doesn't really seem to match what the fly is doing. Um, and if we compare it to the passive model, we indeed see a mismatch between the predicted activity and the measured neural activity within these hook axons. It's a quite stark difference. Um, if we just look at the cross correlation between the two of them, the model does a poor job of predicting what is happening during the active state. So what this means is that the, the, um, under the passive conditions where we're moving the joint around, the activities per receptors is quite different from what we record when the fly is moving itself. And because we're recording from the axon terminal, we think that there's some kind of modulatory signal that is that, is, that accounts for this difference between um, these two signals. And we, can, we see this across different behaviors. So whether the fly is at rest or walking or grooming, we see a general reduction um, in activity when the fly is uh, kind of actively moving um, versus uh, when it is passively moving. And this is particularly clear if we look at these transitions between resting and moving. So 
Here in green are the um, are the measured responses, and then in black are the predictions. What you see is that um, what the model predicts is that when the animal goes from rest to movement, so it's standing still, it starts walking, we'd expect to see an increase in activity, but we don't. Look, this, at this arrow here, it shows that there's not really an increase there. And same thing in the other direction. When the, it goes from movement to rest, we actually see an increase in the activities per receptors, um, whereas the prediction would be that there's a decrease. So there's a mismatch, mismatch between the active um, movements and what the passive model predicts. And so one concern might be that um, we are measuring these two signals under different conditions. In the passive condition, we're moving the limb around. It might be moving slower. Under active conditions, the fly is actively moving. The actual statistics of the stimulus might be different. But what Chris did was to kind of mimic um, the passive movements in his same preparation here. So he put a little steel pin on the fly's leg as he did before, but now the fly is again kind of standing on the ball. And here he would mimic just little movements of the leg, so like little um, flexions or extensions of the tibia. And here we see a good match between the predictions of the model and the actual measured activity. So it's not that there's something just about the preparation that, that means that the um, that accounts for these differences. We actually think that there is some neural signal that is making the active um, encoding properties different from the passive encoding. Okay. We became even more convinced of this when Chris started recording from different parts of the axons of these periphery receptors. So previously, what I was showing you was all recordings from this lateral branch of, of the um, of the periphery receptors. Sorry, from the medial branch of the periphery receptors. Um, so here, let me show both of them. So in the in the medial branch, we see this mismatch. So the, the model predictions um, again are shown here in black, and the measured neural activity is shown in green. And as I've shown you in the previous slide, we see this mismatch between the model predictions and what we record. But if you look in this lateral branch of the same neuron, so these are just a different branch of the same axon, we see that they do match each other. So here, the, the model predictions um, under passive conditions actually match what we record during active movements. Okay, so within the same axons, we have a signal that looks very different then under passive conditions, and we have a signal in another part of the axon that looks very similar. Okay, so um, I'm gonna now explain kind of how, how we're thinking about this. So I showed you um, at the beginning that the encoding of tibia position by the claw axons is quite similar during active and passive leg movements. We don't think there's any modulation there. We also think that in the lateral branch of the hook axons, um, we, we see similarities between passive and active movements. So again, um, these, there's doesn't seem to be any modulation there, but in particular compartments of the hook axons, we see that these calcium signals appear to be suppressed and modulated in interesting ways when the animal is actively mm -hmm. moving. So just to kind of schematize what I've shown you here, the hook axons are coming in from the leg. It splits into two different branches. Um, uh, we think that they're is some inhibitory interneuron or some inhibitory modulatory signal that is impacting the encoding of active movements in the medial branch. Um, we don't yet know what the origin of this signal is. I'm going to talk about that in the second part of the talk, kind of our, our search for figuring this out. Whereas the lateral branch is kind of faithfully encoding the, the movement direction of the leg as we would observe under passive conditions. Um, and so we think that it's presynaptic inhibition of, of this branch during active movement that accounts for this difference between our model predictions and what we actually record. Um, there's also this question of how does the state dependent encoding then affect downstream circuits? So you could imagine that this kind of compartmentalization where you have um, a modulatory signal that, for example, implements a prediction about what the animal is doing in one branch, and then another branch that is actually encoding what the, um, what the animal is doing, that it could be useful to implement some sort of comparison between a prediction of your own intended movements and what is actually happening. So you can imagine downstream circuits that's kind of comparing these two different signals. Um, and you'd also expect that if you recorded from neurons that are postsynaptic to the medial branch that is modulated, you would see some kind of um, effect on downstream coding, some, some manifestation of the suppression. Whereas in the other pathway, you would see 
and a similar encoding to what you'd expect under, under passive conditions. Yes. Yeah, just a, a clarification. Um, so is the model simulating the group of axons in one unit, or are you simulating individual axons and <coughs> simulating what they would be? If you We're just simulating the calcium signal. So it is essentially one unit. Yeah. 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 So, so the prediction then is that whatever is acting here would be acting on the entire group of axons, yes. not individual axons. Right. That's a great point. You could imagine a scenario where every axon gets a different predictive signal. Um, but the thing about the hook axons is that the hook neurons is, as far as we can tell, they're all identical to each other. So the clon neurons in a co-position, they're active at different joint angles. But the hook neurons, we've done single cell recordings only with calcium imaging. But they seem to all become active when the limb is moving. Okay. So you might expect that they would receive similar um, kind of modulatory inputs. Cool. And everything I've shown you here is from the hook flexion neurons, but Chris has now done experiments with the hook extension neurons, and we see basically the same thing. That again, you see modulation that is state dependent in just one branch and not the other branch. And that's another thing that's convinced us that, that, that this phenomenon is, um, is important, is that two kind of separate groups of neurons different genetic tools, you see the same phenomenon. Okay, any other questions about this part? Okay, so um, this is how we think that um, some kind of predictive modulation is modifying the output of proprioceptors. And so now I'm gonna take you into kind of um, even more murky territory, which is trying to answer these two questions. Where is this modulation coming from? Can we identify the source of it? Whatever this inhibitory inner neuron is, or I haven't shown that it's inhibitory, it could be some other type of signal, neuromodulatory signal. Um, can we find that? And then secondly, can we record from postsynaptic neurons and see these kinds of state-dependent effects? Okay, we'll take a bit of a detour now because in order to identify the source of the modulation, We've been using a technique called conatomics. So here, um, in collaboration with Wei Chung Lee's lab at Harvard, we've Wei's lab took a fly ventral nerve cord and they sectioned it into thousands of sections. Um, and they did it on this piece of tape that they then run through a series of electron microscopes. And it, after six months of continuous imaging, they stitch it all together and you end up with a giant EM volume that contains the entire ventral nerve cord. So um, we've had this uh, data set for a few years now. We, we published a paper about the data set a couple of years ago, but since then we have been working with Sebastian Sons group to apply automated um, tools um, for segmentation of all the neurons within the data set. So um, basically you train a convolutional neural network to recognize what a neuron is, and then you let it run on the entire data set and it um, segments each cell into different compartments. Then you go through and manually proofread them to connect neurons together. Um, and we are nearing a kind of draft connectome of the fly ventral nerve cord, all 17,000 neurons and hundreds of millions of synapses. Okay, so I'm not going to talk about the whole thing today. That's for another day. But I'm going to talk about our reconstruction of these proprioceptors that I've um, that I've shown. So. Um, these are the claw and hook proprioceptors that I talked about in the beginning of the talk. So the claw neurons are shown, um, actually these colors are wrong. The claw neurons are shown in blue and the hook neurons are shown in green. So Sweta, a postdoc in lab, and Chris reconstructed these proprioceptors. To give you a sense of scale, mainly tracing one of these neurons. Um, we also mainly traced a few just to check. Mainly tracing one of these axons took somebody about three months of like working reasonably hard. And doing the proofreading to reconstruct them takes a couple of hours. So um, they're big neurons. They may not look very big. I mean, they're, they're tiny in a sense, but they have a ton of cable. They have a ton of synapses. And so we've been able to reconstruct most of the proprioceptors um, from one fly leg. Uh, we can identify whether they're flexion tuned or extension tuned in most cases by a combination of their morphology and also their downstream connectivity. And then we can look at where their synaptic outputs are and their synaptic inputs. So here in Cyan, I'm showing all the synaptic outputs from the different claw axons. And um, you can see they're distributed kind of across the axonal tree. And you also see that their inputs, so these are, are synaptic inputs that could be presynaptic inhibition, 
um, that are again distributed kind of across each of these axons. And we can look at the same thing for the hook neurons. So we have extension tuned neurons and flexion tuned hook neurons. Just remind you, these are the directionally tuned cells. And again, we see that they have synapses that are kind of distributed across um, uh, the entire axon. And the ratio that we see of inputs to outputs, which is kind of what we're interested in, is that there are about 10 times as many output synapses on each probe receptor as there are input synapses. So the ratio of kind of feed forward output to feedback is about 10 to 1. Um, it's similar for quantum hook neurons. Now that we've looked pretty broadly across the nervous system, this is generally what we see for sensory neurons, that they're getting about 10% um, as many inputs as they're providing outputs, which maybe makes some sense. Um, and we're particularly interested in, uh, in these inputs because these we think are the source of this modulatory signal um, that we record in a state dependent manner. Okay, so we can then look at what is which cells are providing presynaptic input to the prep receptor axons. So here, what I'm showing um, on the x-axis here, these are claw axons and these are hook axons, so each column is an axon. And then on the y-axis are all the presynaptic DNC neurons that are providing feed feedback onto the prep receptors. And then the colors here just represent the number of synapses um, of the feedback neurons. And the interesting thing that you see here is that the neurons that are providing feedback to the hook axons are different rows than the ones that are providing feedback to the claw axons. So there, it's not that like all probe receptors are getting the same um, input. They're not all modulated in a similar manner. They don't get all get the same feedback signals. Um, and this is kind of consistent with what I showed you before that the claw axons don't seem to be modulated during behavior, but the hook axons are. Okay. And so what we really want to know is like, what are these cells? What, which one of these is providing the modulatory signal? Uh, fortunately, I don't have that full answer for you right now. We have a, a small list of candidates. So the top candidates that provide the most presynaptic input to hook axons are these ones here. It's, it's a mix of ascending neurons, descending neurons, local neurons. Any of these could be the ones that are providing this input modulation. It could be multiple. And so what we're doing is we can go from the connect home to identifying genetic tools and label these neurons and record from them during behavior. And that's what Chris is doing right now. So next time I come back, maybe we'll have an answer. But the answer will just be that it's like inner neuron AN279 or something like that. So I'm not sure it'll be super interesting. But what we really want to know is what are the dynamics of those neurons? Are they uh, recruited whenever the animal's walking? Are they recruited in like a step-by-step -step manner? Like what is the nature of the prediction that the nervous system is providing the proper centers? Okay, so um, I'm going to uh, talk just a little bit about the cells that are downstream of the cortisol axons. Because remember, I, I proposed before that if this modulation is important, we should see signatures of the modulation in postsynaptic cells. So now if we look at the connectivity matrix of the neurons that are downstream of um, the clon hook axons, we now see that there's quite a bit of overlap. Um, I mean, there are, there are some rows that are specific to just clon hook axons, but many, um, a lot of, uh, a good fraction of the downstream interneurons integrate signals for both claw and hook axons. And you can see that there are many of them. There are probably a hundred or so. So it's not it's not a, as simple as a network as you might expect for fruit flies. Okay, from this network, we actually recognized a particular cell type that we've worked on before that are called the 9A neurons. And um, this was a, a group of axons that, or sorry, a group of interneurons that we thought were post enough to the hook. Kind of because of the shape of their axon. So these are the nine interons here, and then these are the hook axons. You can see that they kind of overlap. And so for this reason, um, we had actually built genetic tools that label these neurons. Um, and a postdoc in Lance Sweda had done whole cell patch type recordings from them um, previously to understand how hook signals are transformed in the central nervous system. So in uh, Sweda's previous work, she used the same setup as before, where we glue a little pin onto the leg and move the leg around. And now instead of doing calcium imaging from the PERP receptors, she would go in with an electrode and patch on to GFP-labeled neurons. So this is an example of a recording from one of these 9A neurons. They're really tiny cells. They fire really, really tiny little action potentials. Um, 
So this here, we're just injecting a series of current steps, looking at spiking activity. And what she found is that they have properties that are somewhat similar to the hook neuron. To the hook neuron. So as you move the leg from extension to flexion, you see um, an increase in the firing rate of these neurons and not in the other direction. So they're um, directionally tuned, which is a property that they probably inherit from the hook neurons. Interestingly, though, this population was very heterogeneous. So sweater reported from about 40 of these neurons, and I'm showing all of them in gray and then the average in, in uh, purple. And you can see the different cells um, have different properties. Some of them are excited in one direction and inhibited in the other direction. It's a kind of a, a heterogeneous group of cells that are collectively representing um, something about the uh, extension and flexion of this joint. Okay. Sweta then uh, followed up on these recordings more recently by doing explicit comparisons of whole cell patch lamp recordings from these inner neurons during passive movements. So she would take the magnet, move the fly's leg around, and then she would kind of poke the fly and try and get the fly to move its own leg. So this is, these experiments are really hard. We only have a handful of recordings right now. And Sweat is definitely trying to get more before she leaves to start her own lab in two months. Um, but under passive movements, we see uh, activity like I showed you before, where the cell depolarizes when the leg, um, in this case, goes from uh, uh, flexion toward extension, or in this case, from extension toward flexion. But then when we record during active movements, so now the fly is actively moving around, we would expect to see in these responses that they would look something like this, but that is not what we see. We see a mismatch, kind of like I showed you before in comparing the passive model to active movements, we see a mismatch between the responses we record during active movements and those we see during pass passive movements. And then, so this is consistent with the idea that this presynaptic inhibition of the axon terminals of the hook neurons has some effect on downstream encoding of active movements versus passive movements. And more of these data are trickling in um, every day. And it, it seems like this, this is going to be borne out that there's a kind of effect on the, on the coding of active movements in central circuits as well as in the axon terminals. OK, so to summarize what I've shown you in the second part of the talk, the axon terminals of the proprioceptors, both claw and hook neurons, receive um, a lot of presynaptic input, so feedback from the central nervous system, about 10% uh, of, of their outputs. Um, and then recordings from second order neurons show at this point what I would call signatures of state dependent modulation. And so the impact of this uh, inhibition onto the, the hook axons is something that affects what is happening downstream. And the, the kind of bigger idea that we're working toward is that this kind of presynaptic modulation, proprioceptive axons, may be a general mechanism for implementing something like a sensor motor prediction. When the animal starts to move, these inhibitory interneurons suppress the output of the proprioceptors um, so that you can tune reflexes in a way that allows the fly, the fly to move um, actively. Whereas under passive conditions, when the animal is just posturally stabilizing, the reflexes are kind of operating in a different regime. And we think this kind of prediction, based on looking at the connectivity and the connectome and recordings in other areas, we think this kind of prediction is happening all over the place within the kind of sensory motor circuits that control the legs. Um, and we think it's a, uh, like I say here, a general mechanism um, for how one tunes reflexes and does prediction um, for low motion. Okay. Um, so I'm going to end this here. I still have a few minutes, so I'm going to move on and talk about snowflies. But first, I'll pause and see if there's any questions about this part. Uh, yes. Oh, great question. No, we did not. None at all. Um, yeah, I never mentioned that because it was such a such a disappointing result. Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, if we just look at like uh, no, so and that is confusing. Right, like um, we still don't understand. I guess you can see here. So, um, what you would expect is that we would find um, neurons that are only presynaptically inhibiting this branch here, but not this branch here. But every neuron that provides feedback targets both branches. And there's a couple where it's asymmetric. And so, we're going after those first. But it could also be, I, I, yeah, it's, it's a bit of a mystery. It could be something about. I mean, you could imagine the distribution of 
receptors is different within the axons. You can imagine a bunch of different scenarios that would allow this compartment specific modulation, but it's is not as simple as the just like an inhibitory interneuron targets one and not the other, um, unfortunately, or maybe not unfortunately, but yeah, great question. Yes. Uh, how does this interface with the central pattern generator? Um, no idea. So we don't know the central pattern generator yet um, in the fly. That's something we're looking for in the connectome, but we don't know. So all of these perp receptors <coughs> um, are required for walking in a sense. So if like, you completely silence them, the fly can't walk. We've done a lot of transient perturbations, and they they evoke like postural movements during walking. I've gone from thinking that the central pattern generator requires perceptive feedback to thinking that actually uh, the, the regular motor rhythm doesn't need it, but in the absence of perception, it doesn't work. Like the fly will not walk if you silence perceptors, but if you, if you do these super transient perturbations, it doesn't actually seem to affect the, the rhythmic component of the motor output. It just kind of drives a little reflexive movements. But if you're walking along and all of a sudden your leg jerks in a crazy way, you stop walking. So that originally led a lot of people to conclude, including us, that it's like required for, for motor output. But um, I think that it's kind of layered on top of it, that there's probably a feed forward circuit that can generate a normal walking rhythm and then it's kind of refined by per perception. Marina's shaking her head. <laughs> So I'm just curious a little bit about, uh, so there's a third context I could imagine this being interesting, which is landing, uh -huh. right? Because right? when the fly is landing, they shoot out the legs and they're basically, yeah. so do you imagine that would be a separate context to admit, or would you imagine this would probably fall into one of the other two that you're saying? Well, first of all, landing is actually immediately, so when the fly lands, they're, I don't know if people have watched a lot of videos of fly, flies landing, but they're, they're pretty clumsy. They're coming at a high speed, and they essentially slam into a wall. But when they do, they grab on really hard. Mm -hmm. That is, that is, we think, very little to do with these proprioceptors. So the cortis homal, or sorry, the campanum harps and scylla that are on the tips ah, of the legs, okay. they, we can see in the connectome, they directly connect to all of the motor neurons they grab on. And so the campanum harps and scylla, specifically on the tarsi, are the ones that mediate landing. Yeah. Oh, oh, thanks. This is really cool work. I'm wondering. Well, I like it because it seems like there's many different neural mechanisms that can get at this idea of getting a sensory prediction error. It reminds me a lot of Kathy Cullen's work on the vestibular only neurons where they thought that it was just a relay. Um, yeah. You know, when, when you passively move the monkey's head, it looks just like it, but then when the monkey's moving their head and you perturb, then you start to see what's called like mm -hmm. an error signal. I'm wondering if Sweat is collecting from the, the medial or the lateral branch of the hook neuron rather than the downstream neurons. And then do you think that the claw neurons, since they do have presynaptic inputs, is there an, another behavior in which those get modulated? Maybe. Yeah, yeah. We think um, for the claw neurons especially, we do see subtle differences between a passive model and, um, and active movements. But we think a lot of that is we, we think a lot of what the feedback is, is doing is that for the claw neurons, there's a lot of mutual information between flexion and extension tube neurons. And so it would make sense to integrate those. And so you can imagine that when the leg is flexed, you inhibit the output of the extension tube neurons. Um, and we think that might change slightly during, um, during active movements, but it's not as dramatic as this. But um, yeah. And Sorry, what was the first part of your question? Is sweat dead collecting from the two branches? Oh. While, while during active versus passive? No, no. I mean, the great, great experiment would be, she, so she's actually set up to do this. <laughs> Patch, this is an experiment she's trying to do. I don't think she's successfully done it. She has G-camp in the hook flexion axons, recording from both branches and patching this downstream neuron. Um, and she can do, she's done them separately and she's, yeah, she's done the two components separately. It just hasn't all come together. And like I said, she's leaving to start her own lab in a couple months. And so um, we basically said, okay, let's try and let's give up on the perfect experiment and just do the recordings from downstream neurons. But yeah, that would be really cool. 
Yes. Hey, we have um, two questions from the chat. The first one is from Simon. He's going to unmute himself, and I think we should hear him. Hey, John, really good talk. Um, can you guys hear me? Yes. yes. Okay, great. Um, really good talk. Really enjoyed it, especially the visuals. You kept my daughter uh, occupied with all the beautiful visuals on there, too. Um, so I think fly legs are probably pretty much non-inertial when they're moving, right? They're small enough that if you're not continuously producing force, they just come to a stop. So that's going to create a really strong correlation between sort of the, the it, basically these static models will work very well in that case. Do you and probably the descending prediction can effectively be sort of quasi static in that way as well. Do you think it's right. different for legs that are inertial? Where yeah, inertia that's really a great matters? question. Um, I mean, I'm glad I don't have to worry about it, but I, it would have to be right. Um, it seems like something you could build in to your prediction, but um, yeah. I, you're right. It, it would have to be. It would have to be different in that manner. Um, how? Yeah, I haven't really thought about how you would actually do that. I think you would probably have better intuition than I do. But um, yeah, you would need the force you, in addition to the position, then probably. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Great Looking point. at Lena. All right, and then we have one more question from Jengis. Hi, that's very good pronunciation. Thanks, Mike. Right. Um, I have a question about or comment about um, um, the um, electrophysiology. You said like the, the action potentials are like one millivolt high. They're like tiny. And that's, that yes. looks very familiar because I work in larval motor neurons and we have like tiny action potentials, but they're like 10 millivolts. And I, there, we found out why it was happening. And we also looked at EM um, beta that uh, action potentials were initiated much further from where we were recording at Somos. I assume it's the same story in invertebrates. You have like a, a space clamp error in there, but I'm, I'm impressed that you can actually count those spikes. Yeah, right. So, I mean, this, this slide shows, um, like we're patching here at the cell body. So in invertebrate neurons, the cell bodies are actually outside of the neuropil. They're so that things can kind of, um, uh, densely interconnect and you keep all the clunky cell bodies on the outside. And so, yeah, we are patching in, in an area, the spike initiation zone. We don't know where it is, but these right. are probably the outputs. So the spike, initi spike initiation zone is somewhere here. The input resistance of one of these cells is probably about one and a half or two giga ohms. And so we think we've done actually a bit of voltage imaging in the, the um, reperceptor axons and they are firing action potentials that look like what you would expect from like a, a mammalian preperceptor, like overshooting zero kind of thing. Right. Um, but everything we're recording is just super, super filtered for that reason. And so we have to high pass filter the data and and actually, but we know that they're they're TTX sensitive, so we can block them. So we're pretty sure that they're action potentials. Right, right. So actually I have a question about like how, this is like really impressive, like what you did in the adult adult flies, because I know that in larva they They've been doing this for a while. So the question is like, is there a mapping from the larval neurons to the neurons you're looking at? Or during the pupations, like everything is like reconfigured? There are similarities, but when a larval fly goes through metamorphosis, the motor system is kind of completely torn apart and then put back together. Right. So the motor neurons, very few of them survive metamorphosis and are the same in the larvae and the adult. Um, there are similarities in that, like these 9A interneurons, there are also interneurons from the same hemi, hemi lineage that exists in the larvae, and they also get input from prey receptors, and they also provide output to motor neurons. So there are places where there are similarities, and I, I think that's actually, for me, one of the most fascinating questions. Sweat and I wrote a review paper about this last year, because I think that it's not something that, I, I think if you work on flies for a while and you see the larvae, you see the adult, and you realize that they're two different animals, basically in one. Like doing that kind of comparison will be incredibly fascinating. We have a larval connectome. We almost have an adult fly connectome. Like annotating cell types within those and looking at their connectivity, I think is going to be super, super interesting. And I'm really excited about it. That's really exciting. Thanks so much. All right, we just have one more question from the chat, and then sure. I promise we'll let you move on. This is from Chris Rogers. Hey, thanks. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay. I was just wondering, uh, you sort of alluded to this. 
could you say a little bit more about more general sensory motor predictions that you think might happen other than just reflex reversal? I don't know, maybe something that integrates across legs or with other sensory systems? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, we I, I can't say anything very specific about it other than like, I know that it's there. We've focused a lot on just one leg because when, when I started the lab, nobody had studied these circuits at all. And so we made the decision just to kind of dive into local control of one leg. But now that we have a connectome, like there are intersegmental connections, um, like thousands of them across the different leg segments. And so these kind of like reafferent predictions, meaning like one perp receptor on one leg that is affecting the output of a, of a motor neuron or a motor circuit on another leg, um, we think that those things are kind of layered across the whole nervous system. We just haven't really studied them very much yet. Um, but I think that a lot, a lot of what the ventral nerve board is doing is like providing some kind of context for these sensory motor loops. And so, yeah, I think it's there and hopefully it's something we make some progress on in the next 10 years. Thanks. Okay, I think we're out of time. So maybe I'll... I'll skip the snowflake part and just go to um, the acknowledgements. So this is my group. Um, Chris did all of the um, cows managing and walking flies. Sweta did the um, patch knife recordings, as well as uh, Chris and Sweta worked together as, along with basically the whole group on the comic stuff. Um, Pierre has worked on the modeling and also developed the 3D tracking tools. And, um, and I should also just acknowledge Akira, who was the one who built, originally built the original um, motor control system of the leg. And um, also uh, thank our collaborators and funding sources and all of you for your attention. Thanks.